And we're back with an example of series resonance. <sighs> and the crowd goes wild. Okay, so we indicated last time with a simple series network consisting of a voltage source in this case with some resistance, a nice ideal inductor over here and a capacitor. There would be some particular frequency where X sub L and X sub C would be equal. They basically cancel out. And what that leaves us for a system impedance is just the value of R. Right? We could say in general the system impedance would have to be R plus JXL minus JXC. So at some particular frequency, we understand that X sub L and X sub C are going to have the same magnitude, they cancel out. Z of the system will equal R. What does that do? That produces a maximum current, produces a peaking current, right? At low frequencies, X sub C sort of opens up, that drops off the current. At very high frequencies, X sub L, same thing, gets very large value, that limits current. But right there in the middle where these two things cancel, um, the R value is all we have. So we get a maximum current, right? Um, we can use that to select out certain frequencies. And we define just how tight that's, that curve is by a factor known as Q, the quality factor. And that can be defined two ways. It can be defined in terms of the ratio of the circuit reactance to the circuit resistance, or it can be defined in terms of that center frequency that we're going to find, that resonant frequency, uh, versus the range of frequencies that we'll consider. That range is defined in terms of an upper and a lower limit frequency, which are uh, defined in terms of half the power um, of the central resonant frequency. All right, so how do we find this? All right, as long as I know those, these two uh, values, an inductance value and a capacitance value, we can use a formula we derived for that resonant frequency. F0 is equal to 1 divided by 2 pi times the screw root of LC. All right, so let's just throw some numbers here. We'll say this is let's say a 50 ohm resistor, 1 millihenry coil, and a 1 nanofarad capacitor. All right, so we'll just plug the numbers in here, work our way through. All right, so we have a 1 millihenry coil, 1 nanofarad cap, our resonant frequency will work out to 159 kilohertz. All right, so at 159 kilohertz, this X sub L and this X sub C are the same size. They cancel out. Well, what is that X sub L value? All right, well, we can find that just using the normal formula for uh, X sub L. Plug our values in here. 159K and 1 millihenry, and X sub L will work out to 1,000 ohms. All right, so at the resonant frequency, we basically have 50 plus J1000, and this will be minus J1000. All right, so they cancel out, and all we're left with is a resonant impedance um, of 50 ohms. Okay, that's Z at resonance. All right, knowing that, we can figure out what the uh, Q of this network is, right? So the system Q, system series Q, however you want to say that, will be the X sub L divided by the R total. Okay, so our X sub L is 1,000 ohms. And the total resistance we have in here is that one 50 ohm resistor value. So we divide that out and we have a system Q of 20, right? The quality factor is 20. We can now relate that back to the bandwidth and the central frequency. Bandwidth would equal the resonant frequency, the center frequency, divided by the system Q. So we have 159 kilohertz. And 20 for the system Q. So that works out to 7.95 kilohertz. All right, now with a Q of 20, 10 and above we consider as high Q systems. And when we have a high Q system, we can do a nice little approximation 
that the bandwidth splits in half. Half above F0, that's how we find F2, and half below, that's how we find F1. In reality, it's really the ratios of those things that are consistent. In other words, the ratio of F1 to F0 is the same as the ratio of F0 to F2. Right? But as long as the Q is high, it will be very close if we just split this in half, add or subtract that to the central frequency. So F1 is approximately equal to F0 minus the bandwidth divided by 2. All right, so that's going to be 159 kHz minus 7.95 kHz divided by 2. And our F1 is going to be approximately equal to 155 kilohertz. Similarly, we look at F2. So we just add that little piece, 159K plus the 7.95K over 2. Right, you know, basically 4 kilohertz. So we're looking at uh, just approximately 163k on that. Okay, so if we did a little plot on this thing, you know, what we would say is the, the curve would kind of come up like this. This is our frequency. This could be the circulating current or it could be the voltage across the 50 ohm. This is, proportionally, they're going to be the same. So our center frequency right is right here, that's F0. Here's the F1, here's the F2, and these two amplitudes, right, are going to be about 70.7%, 7 1 over the square root of 2, times this peak value, right? That's how we get the half power. So the current squared, or voltage squared, is proportional to power. So we need about 70.7% .7 of that peak value, that's where we'd get those. Right, so we're saying the distance from here to here, from F1 to F2, uh, is basically just shy of 8 kilohertz, right? 4 kilohertz plus and minus on that center frequency of 159 kilohertz, right? All right, so what are the individual voltages? Well, since these things canceled out, all we have left is the 50 ohm, so we could find out what that circulating current is at the resonant frequency, right? That would just be 10 volts divided by the Z0, the 50 ohms, which would get you 2 tenths of an amp, right? And that would be perfectly in phase, of course. That's what we would see across this. Uh, excuse me, uh, 0.2 times the 50 ohms, which would give us the 10 volts. Oops, forgot to put that in there. Uh, that would give us 10, the, the 10 volts that we were um, applying. Now, across the um, inductor across the capacitor, we're going to take that same current and we're going to multiply it by the X sub C or the X sub L, right? So if I want to find VL, I'll take that current times XL and my X is a thousand ohms. So that's going to get us 200 volts, right? Now, in reality, of course, that's, at a, um, that's a plus J, right? The X sub L. So this is at 90 degrees, but the magnitude's 200 volts. Similarly for VC, we are going to get the same magnitude, but it'll be at minus 90, right, minus J. It's still 200 volts. So these things basically cancel out. If you did a um, little phasor diagram on this, you'd see something kind of like this. Here would be your 50 volts on the resistor, then you've got the 200 volts on the inductor and the 200 volts on the capacitor, right? So these things cancel out, these two verticals, and all you're left with is the real part right there. All right, so that all adds up really nice. The other way we can do this is to indicate that um, the voltage across the reactive components, I'll just call it Vx, would have to be Q times whatever your source voltage is. Well, the system Q is 20, and the source voltage is 10 volts peak, so that's 200 volts peak, right? Now, a circuit like this, you could very easily build up in lab. You know, 50 ohm resistor, 1 millihenry, 1 nanofarad, 10 volts coming out of your uh, function generator, no big deal, right? Easy to build in lab. 
potentially dangerous. 200 volts sitting across one of these reactive components, right? You don't want to be sticking your fingers in there in that circuit. You should never be doing that, right? Okay. Now, a little bit more practical. Real-world inductors have some associated internal resistance, right? There is a coil resistance associated with that thing. And the manufacturer will give us a, a spec sheet. It will probably give us some kind of curve might look, I don't know, maybe something like this, where we're going to plot Q of coil versus frequency. So what are we talking about as far as Q of coil is concerned? Well, just like Q of system is X over R, it's the same thing for the Q coil. Right? That's just the um, XL over R coil. R coil is what we're interested in finding. Right? I'm interested in finding this. Remember, you can't just take a, a DMM and just you know, put it on ohms and measure the quote-unquote resistance of the inductor because that will give you the DC coil resistance. And this is going to change over frequency. You know, um, skin effect basically makes the electrons move, the conductors move towards the outer surface. That reduces the cross-sectional area, which basically increases the resistance um, at higher frequencies. So the manufacturer will give us a curve like this. And what we would do is... Um, find the frequency of interest, right, come up over, find out what the Q coil is, and then we could calculate at that frequency what the value of R coil is. And then that gets added in. So we could kind of think of this as being sort of a real world inductor, you know, part inductance, part little resistance. So let's say that the manufacturer um, of this particular coil, right, at 159 kilohertz, And then we come up here and, I don't know, just for, just for argument's sake, you know, let's just say that's uh, like 50. Okay, that's the Q coil is 50. All right, so we're going to rework this equation. We know Q coil, we know X of L, right? Our X of L was 1,000 ohms, so we can find out what our coil is. All right, so I'm going to have 1,000 divided by the Q coil of 50. So our, our coil is going to be 20 ohms. So we just think of this as an extra 20 ohms in here. All right? Okay. So now to redo this, what changes? Well, as long as the uh, system queue um, doesn't get, uh, you know, totally wacky, I mean, we're, we're going to see um, similar kinds of results, but in general, Added resistance is going to mean the system Q is going to drop and the bandwidth is going to expand, which means the F1 and F2 are going to move outward, right? The F1 is going to get a little lower, the F2 is going to get a little lower, oh, excuse me, a little higher. The current's going to drop down, the voltages across the reactive components are going to increase a little bit, right? We shouldn't see, you know, wholesale changes. I mean, um, you know, we're not going to see like the critical frequency suddenly. Uh, you know, drop down to 6 kilohertz or some crazy thing like that, but we are going to see this general curve sort of spread out. The um, Q system can never be bigger than Q coil. So that does set a ceiling. Now in this particular case, you know, we have a Q system of 20, the Q coil is 50, will this have, you know, a big negative impact? Will it really broaden this a lot. Well, you know, there's only one way to find out, and that's to actually re -go, you know, go through this again with the new resistance value. I mean, this is still true. This is still true. That's still true. This is still true. This is no longer true. Right? Z0 is no longer 50. We have to throw another 20 ohms in there. So with this um, uh, new version of the circuit, right, your R0 basically is going to be the 50 plus the R coil, which is going to give you 70 ohms. All right, so what's the impact of, of that? Well, what's our new Q system? All right, still XL over R total. Our, our total has changed. So we still have 1,000 ohms for the inductor, but we have 70 ohms for total resistance out here. All right, that's going to drop our Q from 20 down to 14.3. All right, what's the side effect of that? 
Well, that's going to impact the bandwidth. Okay, so the bandwidth, same equation, 159K, but notice we have 14.3 now instead of 20. So the bandwidth is going to broaden a little bit. Right? This is going to turn into 11.13 kilohertz from the original 7.95. Right? So those F1 and F2 values are going to spread out a little bit. You take half of this, which is a little over 5.5, 5.56 uh, roughly kilohertz, plus or minus on the F1 and the F2, and your F1 now is going to be uh, 159 right, minus half of that, and that's going to be roughly 153.4 kHz. All right, so you've gone from 155 to 153.4, and F2 similarly 159. Oops, 159k plus half the bandwidth. And that's going to give us about 164.6k. So we went from 163 up to there. All right, so these these are now moving out. So it's kind of like it's um, getting like kind of flatter like this, right? So this, this guy's going to wind up over here somewhere, and then this one's going to wind up over here somewhere. The total peak has dropped down, and that kind of, it's kind of like pushing down on this thing, and it's spreading out. All right, that's kind of a way of sort of visualizing it. Now the circulating current at resonance, I still have my 10-volt source, but we don't have the 50 ohms anymore, right? We have the 70. So we throw 70 ohms in here. What's our circulating current? Instead of getting 0.2 amps, we're getting 143 milliamps. Now, you pass that through the appropriate um, components, and we're going to notice, hey, I'm not going to have a full 10 volts across that 50 anymore. Right? You know, we're going to have, uh, you know, like 7, uh, excuse me, 7.15 roughly volts across here. Um, some of that voltage sort of appears, if you will, on this internal 20 ohm coil resistance. Um, when we go to measure this with a scope, it won't be too far off. There will be a little bit of an effect there, but the actual uh, voltage across the inductive part's a lot bigger, so we don't see much of a change. Um, we can approximate this, right? We can take this 0.143 and uh, multiply by the X sub L and the X sub C value, so the um, VL is going to be approximately 143 volts, right? And again, that'll be at plus 90. Put a little note over there. And the VC, similarly, 143 volts and the angle on that will be minus 90. Or, you know, we could do this. We could just say it's Q times the source. So the Q over here is 14.3, so I can say 14.3 times the 10 volts. There's my 143. Now, like I said, if you measure this, you won't get exactly that value for the inductor because there is this extra little bit of 20 ohms in there, right? That 20 times um, this is going to throw in an extra couple of volts. So instead of having this perfect 143 at 90 degrees, it's actually going to bend over a little bit. You know, maybe it's going to be 89 degrees or 88 and a half or something like that. Um, but ultimately, if you know, you do a proper phasor diagram, everything will work out. Um, and as we get lower and lower in Q, in other words, basically as the our coil gets bigger and bigger compared to the circuit resistance, this effect sort of magnifies, right? This starts to shift a little bit. Things get broader. All of these things move around a little bit. Um, at the other extreme, you know, if, if um, we had less resistance, for example, if you, know, you went in lab and you literally got rid of this, the only resistance you would have would be 20 ohms. Okay, so you'd have 20 ohms over here, um, 1,000 ohms for the X sub L, and now you have a system Q of 50. Right? That's as good as it could ever be, right? As we said before, system Q can't be any better than Q coil. So you got 50. So what does that do? Everything tightens up now. All right, so your F1 and your F2 move in toward F0. The current's going to go up because you only have 20 ohms now. Now you have half an amp. And of course, the voltages across these things 
go way up as well. Now you have a Q of 50, yeah, it's possible you could have 500 volts across those components from a 10 volt source. Right? That's the thing to remember right? when you're in lab. Be careful about that kind of stuff. Okay, so this is a nice example of uh, a series resonance circuit. We see what's going on at this particular frequency, X of L and X of C cancel out. We get our resonant frequency, find the uh, reactance value, sum up the total resistance in the circuit. That allows us to find the system Q. From there we can find the bandwidth. From that we can find the upper and lower break frequencies, the half power frequencies. And as a general rule we can say the voltage across the reactive components will simply be the system Q times whatever the source, for, source voltage is. Remembering that these are in opposite phase so they cancel out. Alright, there you go.